Okay, so as we go through the code of ethics, there is a 25 question test that comes at the end that uh, you'll have to answer. And so in, as I go through, I will give you the, I can't say this is a test question, but what I can do is let you know this is a key concept. So I happen to give you 25 key concepts throughout the class. And there's 25 questions on the exam, so see if you can find a correlation there somewhere. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today, we're going to identify the aspirational concepts in the preamble of the code. We're going to describe general business ethics. We're going to talk about articles 1 through 17 and what would be a violation of them. We're going to describe the professional standards process and the elements of due process as they relate to the code, and then identify factors are considered by a hearing panel in procuring cause cases on arbitrations. Okay, so if I was doing the full live class, I would have a have you actually go to these corners. See, I see I A, B, C, and D in the room here? So what year was the code established? I'm not going to make you go there. But anybody have any idea of what year the code was established? The answer is B. We'll get to in a second. So first off, before the 1900s, or pre, early out, early in the 1900s, before we had anything, there was no licensing of real estate practitioners. There was speculation, exploitation, and disorder. And caveat emptor governed transactions. Do we know what caveat emptor means? Buyer beware. So... That's one of the key concepts is the code is not based on caveat emptor. Um, another key concept, though, is at the time the code was adopted, there were no licensing laws. So NAR came out with a code of ethics prior to any license laws in any state. So NAR formed in 1908, known then as the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges. Anybody have any idea what year the Santa Barbara Association of Real Estate, Santa Barbara Association of Realtors, which was by some other name also, what year we began? Anybody yeah. have any idea? 1908. So what happened is a group of brokers in Chicago started the National Association of Realtors, not knowing necessarily it was going to be go morph into national, but they had their board of real estate exchanges trying to say, We've got an issue where people don't trust people selling property. Somebody comes in and says, I want to buy this parcel of land. And somebody says, oh, sure, I'll sell that to you. And they just fill out a deed, but they never owned it. And how would you ever know? And so the real brokers started an organization to say, if we're part of this, it's because we all believe in doing it right. And we're going to uh, do that. So the, the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges began same thing happened in Santa Barbara. We started a local group here. We didn't become a part of the National Association until it was 1918. So we've just hit our 100 years with them, but our association actually is as old as NAR and older than the California Association. So the answer to the question I had earlier was the Code of Ethics was adopted in 1913. Um, Established professional standards for conduct was the first ethical code for business after medicine, engineering, and law. And it focused on service to the public and our commitment to professionalism and includes duties to clients and duties to other brokers. Um, so a key concept is the code of ethics was adopted to establish standards of, and conducts for the industry. And the code protects the buying and selling public. Those are two key concepts. Code protects buying and selling public and standards, it was adopted to establish standards and conduct for the industry. So the code was, a, was the basis for later adopted license laws. So in California, licensing happened, started in 1919. Well, we had the Code of Ethics as of 1913, so when they adopted laws in 1919 to say you have to be licensed, a lot of what they put in that came out of the original Code of Ethics from the National Association. 
Since its inception, all the way back in 1908, the Code of Ethics required arbitration of contractual disputes between realtors. It also had in their respect for other brokers exclusive relationship with their clients and, and to have cooperation among and between realtors. So we have coming up is the time of business ethics, the code of ethics and pathways to professionalism. In business ethics, and here's a key concept, is the concept of ethics generally relates to some reference to standards, including legal standards and professional moral standards. Um, so it could be from company policies, individual moral values, whatever, talking about ethics. So we have two issues. One is business ethics, which you have to take a business ethics class when you renew your license. And then we also have information specific to the code of ethics. So realtors share one common characteristic, and regardless of what business specialty they're in, all realtors are bound by the code of ethics. And that is just part of membership. When you join the realtor association, you are agreeing that you will abide by the code of ethics. So if you look at the code that you have, and if you don't have it at home, uh, you can download that from NAR. Um, we have to, at the beginning of, of it is the preamble. Um, I'm going to go back one second. We have a key concept, and that is that the preamble to the code establishes ideals for which realtors should strive. So the preamble is ideals for which realtors should strive. We know that under all is the land for, for real property. So the golden rule is found in the preamble to the code of ethics, and that's a key concept, that the golden rule is part of the preamble. And that is to treat others the way you want to be treated. So that's a good starting point always. So there's no violation if you don't per se, because it's in the preamble and you can't violate the preamble. Um, so as I just said there, alleged violations cannot be used as discipline. So once we get into the code itself, there are three sections. And this is a key concept just as shown, that there are three sections, duties to clients and customers, duties to the public, and duties to other realtors. And within the structure code, there are 17 articles. And each article gives a broad statement of ethical principles. And only the articles of the code can be violated. So we'll find, in addition to that, we have standards of practice. And standards of practice support, interpret, and amplify each of those articles. And they can't be cited themselves, but they can be used in support of an alleged violation. So the intent of the standards of practice is, okay, Article 1 says you have a fiduciary duty to your clients. Well, what does that really mean? So it gives now more specifics of what that means, but you can't violate a standard of practice. You can only violate the article itself. So as a key concept is articles of the Code of Ethics are the broadest statements of ethical principles, standards of practice support, interpret, and amplify the articles under which they are stated. Additionally, on the NAR site, they have case interpretations. So if any of you want to dig deeper into this and go, I want to really understand articles such and such. Well, you could actually look it up and look at the case interpretations on that and see where there have been actual cases and what the hearing panel found um, on some of these close call issues. So how it evolves, amendments are made during the mid-year and realtor conference. The NAR board of directors meets twice a year. And during those meetings, they have a professional standards committee that would make recommendations to the board of directors about changes. And then they have an interpretations and procedures subcommittee that will bring things forward saying we might we recommend some changes, et cetera. I one time sat through their meeting, which was scheduled from one to five in the afternoon. And the vast majority of that time was on who can file a complaint. And the rule had said anyone can file a complaint. And after three hours of debate, it got changed to any real person can file a complaint. All because someone had said, if you keep doing that, my office is going to file a complaint against you. 
Well, an office can't file a complaint, only a person can file a complaint. So for clarity, they changed the rule to any real person can file a complaint. So I haven't been back to see what other stuff they talk about. because That was a long three hours, or four hour meeting, three hours on just that one issue. Um, so the code and the law, how does that line up? Well, the code of ethics must be reasonably construed within the law, but it imposes duties above and in addition to duties imposed by law and regulate certain fundamental legal principles. So one thing you need to know is that the code is not law. So if there's enforcement of it, it's not a matter of, well, the law says, as an example, you can't have hearsay. Well, ours are private rules and it's private enforcement of private rules. And so if we want to allow hearsay, that's up to us if we want to do that What's, what happens in courts um, does not pertain, other than you know basic tenets of law, we have to follow, obviously, and we do follow due process, et cetera. So you all have the pathways to professionalism also, and we talked about that in the MLS side, um, but it talks about respect for the public, respect for property, respect for peers. I do recommend you read through that at some point in time about the, what's aspirational about doing a good job. So let's look quickly then on the enforcement of the code. And every association is responsible for uh, enforcing the code. It includes providing mediation, conducting ethics and arbitration hearings, and only realtors in our case are subject to the code. Um, and it says realtors are realtor associates. In some areas, brokers are realtors and salespeople are realtor associates. We changed, we used to have that, but probably 15, 20 years ago changed to an all realtor board. Everyone's called a realtor, whether they're a broker or a salesperson. So enforcement and association where someone holds membership or gains MLS access has jurisdiction. So if someone is a member here and they commit a violation, no matter where in the state they commit the violation, the hearing should be here if they're a member here unless they're also a member in one of those other areas. Um, associations do not determine violations of law and regulation. Because there are times someone will come in and say, well, in addition to the fact they violated article such and such, they also violated the law by committing fraud or whatever it was that they had done. Well, our people don't deal with the fraud issue. They only deal with the code issue. Um, and so there are times, and it's been very rare, but there have been times where something needs to be turned over either to the Department of Real Estate or to the District Attorney's Office Fraud Unit or something because a complaint came to us that actually was beyond the scope of what we deal with and needed to be kicked to a higher level. So on dispute resolution, we talked about there's an informal and formal process. Informally, we have an ombudsman. It's someone that can just help get both sides talking to see if they can work something out, talk to person A, find out what their issue is, talk to person B, see what their issue is, then go back and report back and see if they can help people come to a, a resolution. We have mediation where people sit down in the same room and try to work out their issues um, without going through a formal process. And then the second option is our formal process where we actually have complaints filed or arbitration requests. So our ombudsman program, it's a voluntary process. These are senior folks within our association, typically brokers who have been in the business a long time that understand the issues um, and are very low key, helpful, not judgmental. Let's just help people try to work things out. Um, If somebody does talk to an ombudsman, they don't get resolution, that does not give up their right to still file a complaint. They could do that if they wanted to. So ombudsman's role is communication and conciliation, not adjudication. They do not determine if a violation has occurred or not. Um, but hopefully they can help resolve something before an actual case arises, if it's appropriate, because sometimes it's not appropriate to work something out. It's just a matter of having a case. So an ombudsman can help repair the breakdowns in communication and help resolve things. 
We also have mediation then, which is a voluntary process. Um, unless we require it, we don't require it. Mediation is recommended by us, but we don't mandate it. Um, and uh, okay, so we can, we could mandate if we want to, we, we don't. So disputing parties meet a mediation appointed by the association. They come up with a, hopefully come up with a mutually acceptable answer instead of having to go through a, a, a hearing. It's the preferred dispute resolution of the National Association of Realtors and us, and it must be available to all realtors, which it is. If a re mediation agreement is, if reached, if an agreement is reached, it's signed off and then no arbitration is held. So typically an arbitration is filed, we recommend mediation. If mediation solves it, they just sign off saying they're done. If it doesn't, then they would go to an arbitration. So why would you use it? Well, mediation is less expensive, it's faster, has a maximum range of solutions because it's up to the parties to come up with their own solutions. They control the outcome, the parties do, and it, the disadvantage is that it's uncertain closure. You may or may not come to resolution. And NAR feels it would help maintain and improve relationships. I'm hoping that's the case, I can't guarantee that. They sometimes put people in the room and it is not a good thing. So. Let's see. But on arbitration, it is more expensive, takes longer. There's a win, lose, or split. I mean, that's it. It's who's, who gets the money? That's the only option. The arbitrator controls the outcome, and it might be that neither party likes the answer. Um, but there's definite closure. It's done when they're done. And the feeling of NAR is it could harm their relationships. Okay. So who can file an ethics complaint? Anybody know that one? Any real person, right? So anybody can file. It doesn't have to be another realtor. Um, so as a key concept, it's not true that only members of the public can file complaints. It can be filed by another realtor. It could be filed by any real person. Okay. So once a complaint gets filed, the first step is an initial screening by the grievance committee. And that's a key concept. The ethics process includes an initial screening by the grievance committee. And what they do is they have to presume that everything that's written is true. And if it's true, would there be a violation of the code of ethics? So they have to look at the complaint as written and see, does it match up with the articles in the code? So one example I give you, because I chaired the grievance committee for five years, was that we had a complaint come in one time that said the agent was rude, used profanity, and yelled at their client. I think you'd all agree that they shouldn't do any of those things. But the code of ethics doesn't say anywhere in it, you can't be rude, you can't yell, and you can't use profanity. It just doesn't exist in the code. So we had to say as the grievance committee, we're not sending this on for a hearing because there's no article that's been violated. So we were very careful when we went back to that complainant saying, we don't agree with the behavior. But unfortunately, the way the 17 articles of the code are written, none of them pertain to being rude or yelling, et cetera. Um, so a second key concept under grievance is that based on the fact that their job is only to look at the facts and say, if this was true, would there be a violation? The grievance committee cannot conduct a hearing. So if they want more evidence or they need more information, they can't conduct a hearing. Only the Professional Standards Committee can conduct a hearing. The Grievance Committee is just that screening process of do they move it forward or do they not. So then we have the Professional Standards hearing, and they'll have a tribunal. When we say a tribunal, it means three members from the Professional Standards Committee will act as judge and jury, to use legal terms. It's not really what they're doing, but they are the panel that's making the determination of is there a violation, and if so, what the discipline should be. And so in a professional standards hearing, the evidence has to be made by a clear, strong, and convincing evidence. So it doesn't say evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, as is the court standard. It's clear, strong, and convincing is, is what they have to meet, what they have to prove in a professional standards hearing. If a violation is found, then it's up to the panel to determine what is the appropriate discipline. And so here's what the discipline can be. 
It can be a letter of warning or a letter of reprimand or education or a fine not to exceed $15,000, probation of one year or less, suspension of not less than 30 days or more than a year, expulsion from membership from one to three years, or suspension or termination of MLS privilege if it was an MLS violation. So there's two key concepts here. One is that disciplinary action can include a fine up to $15,000. And the second one is that discipline in an ethics case may include more than one form. And that's actually often the case. So it might be that someone's found in violation of one of the sections and they have to pay a fine and attend a live ethics class to get retrained on what the code says. And that if they don't pay their fine, then they'll be suspended. So something like that. So it can be a, a multitude of things in there. So that's a key concept that ethics case may include more than one form of punishment. So is there anybody here today that's taking an ethics class because they got mandated to do that as part of a professional standards case? I know that's not the case or I would not have asked the question. Um, so that, it's rare. And, and just so you know, on professional standards cases, we probably hear two or three cases a year. We have 1,300 members of the Association of Realtors, and yet we only have two or three ethics hearings a year. There was some years, a few more, some years we've had none. Um, so it's, it's not like, oh, agents are out there all the time being awful and being held accountable. Frankly, I think one reason we have such a low number is we have excellent broker communication in Santa Barbara. So if an issue is arising between offices, those brokers will start talking and they'll work stuff out and it doesn't come into a formal complaint. Um, but not to say, because I don't want to say that we only have two or three violations a year. We only have two or three hearings a year. There's a lot of violations that never get reported. So the primary emphasis of the discipline is to, for educational, creating a heightened awareness and appreciation for the code and to get compliance. Okay, so let's talk about arbitrations. So here's a, a question for you if I was doing the, the big class and that is, who can file it? A broker of one office against a broker of a different office? A client against a broker? A salesperson against a broker of the same office? Or a salesperson on an office against a salesperson or a broker of a different office? So is it just one of those? Is it one, two, or three? Is it one, three, and four? Is it all, some? And the answer is it's A, one and two. It's a broker of one office against a broker of a different office or a client against a broker can file an arbitration. So let's drop down to three and four then. Three says a salesperson against a broker of the same office. In the eyes of the law, everyone in a brokerage is one entity financially. So how a broker pays their sales associates is an internal matter. It's nothing that we as an association would ever get involved with. Then a salesperson of an office cannot file a complaint against a sales, an arbitration against a salesperson of the office. They could file an ethics complaint, but they can't file an arbitration <coughs> because only a broker can because it's a money dispute and all money is paid to brokers. So if you're not aware of that, when you're a salesperson, the client pays the broker, the broker pays you. Because sometimes I hear agents say, well, the broker took such and such out of my commission. No, the broker got 100% of the commission and the broker then paid you whatever percentage the broker is supposed to pay you. Um, because all money, it's illegal for a salesperson to get compensated directly from a client or another salesperson or broker. Only a broker can be compensated. It's up to the broker then to compensate the salesperson. Just a point of law that not everybody gets. Okay, so if there is an arbitration, it's conducted under Article 17, which is the one that talks about arbitrations and they follow those rules. Um, on contractual or specific non-contractual disputes. So anyway, it's basically a money dispute. And a key concept is that arbitration hearings are often based on a procuring cause dispute between realtors associated with different firms. That's the most common. 
Somebody says, well, they got paid a commission and I should have gotten that money instead or I should have gotten part of it. You know, we had an agreement that I was going to get a referral fee. I never got paid my referral fee. You know, something like that. it's a money dispute, usually over procuring cause, though, when I just gave the example on a referral fee wouldn't necessarily be. But who brought in the buyer and therefore who should get paid? So if there is a hearing, the Professional Standards Committee holds a full due process hearing. You have the right to witnesses. You have the right to testify. You have the right to cross-examine. Um, those types of things. We talk about due process. You have a right to have an attorney with you if you want to have an attorney with you. The tribunal, again, it's three members, are members of the Association's Professional Standards Committee. And after a hearing panel decides which party is entitled to the award, it's based on the preponderance of evidence. So now it's basically you can kind of look at it on the scale. Which side had the high, most weight on the scale? They're going to win. And so an award can be judicially enforced if there is one, but it can also be that it doesn't have to be a full amount. It can be, well, we think it should have been split 60-40, 70-30, 100-0, whatever it is that's up to that panel. Um, some associations require award money to be deposited. We've never had that issue or we've had to, and so we don't, um, plus – Often there's a known issue if there's going to be a dispute before an escrow closes. And so typically escrow holds the commission monies and doesn't dis distribute them until the arbitration case is heard. Um, this is new, the bottom one. This was just added last year. A failure to pay can result in suspension of membership. Something that probably should have been in all, all along, but nobody thought about until last year, is that if somebody was supposed to pay an arbitration to another member and didn't pay it, you'd have the right to say, um, we're going to suspend your membership until you do pay. Okay, so in the arbitration guidelines, it's found in the Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual. You can find that on nar.realtor. Um, it guides the hearing panels in resolving the arbitrable issues. Primary focus is on procuring cause as the basis of resolving most commission disputes, as we had mentioned. So here's some questions for you. Per procuring cause rules, commission is owed to, is it A, the one who first mentioned a property to a buyer as long as he or she has a signed agency disclosure? Is it B, the one who showed the property to the buyer? Is it C, the one who wrote the accepted offer? Or is it D, procuring cause rules just don't say? And the answer is D. Procuring cause rules don't say it. It says that every case must be held, heard on its own merits. So what it says here is there's no predeterminers. You have to consider the entire course of events, writing an offer, making a first showing, et cetera, to not necessarily determine procuring cause. And let me explain the why that goes with that. So say I'm showing property to somebody, and I'm the first one to show the house, and and they like the house, but they also feel that I'm a bumbling idiot and they would never want me to be the one to write a contract for them and negotiate on their behalf. They wouldn't feel comfortable with me. And so they want to change and use a different agent. Should a client have the right to do that? Yeah, they should. Clients should never be locked in to have to use somebody that they don't feel is going to do a good job for them. So if you had a rule that said whoever shows the house first gets paid, well, now you're forcing clients to work with somebody against their will. So we can't have that rule. But what if we had a rule that said, whoever writes the offer gets paid? Let me tell you about a real case that happened to one of my agents back when I had an office. He had on Friday found this property that just came up as a new listing and said, this is exactly what my client's looking for. Calls the agent and said, I want to get my client in there. How soon can we show it? And the agent says, oh, they're, they're doing a whole bunch of cleanup stuff. And they said no showings until the open house, 1 o'clock on Sunday. And they're going to be doing yard work and everything right up till 1 o'clock. I mean, they are pushing it to get this house ready. So no showings until the open house. So our agent realizes, well, I've got an open house at 1 o'clock on Sunday, so I can't take them there. So he talks to his client and said, 
you need to see this house. I think it's a good one for you. It looks like a good price. It may not last. So you need to go see it first thing at that open house. Take some of my cards with you and let the other agent know you're working with me. They said, okay, fine. So they did that. Our agent then ends up selling the house he's holding open. So he's busy all Sunday afternoon and evening negotiating the contract and things. Didn't get a chance to follow up with the client. Calls him on Monday and said, what would you think of that house? They said, we loved it. You were right. That's why we bought it. And he said, what do you mean you bought it? You said you'd have me represent you. He says, oh, that's what we want to have happen. But the agent who was there said that you guys have an agreement that if he writes it up, that, that he could then turn it back over to you to be our representative. And our agents go, we never had any such agreement. He has no right to represent you. That's fraud. He lied to you. And so as the broker, I called his broker. And yes, it was, in fact, a lie. There was no such deal. And so he ended up having to void out his contract. We then rewrote a new, new offer on behalf of the client, got it accepted, et cetera. But he had committed fraud to get the people to write the offer with him. So if the rule said whoever writes the offer gets paid, then the Professional Standards Committee is locked into having to go with that. So that's why procuring cause has to be open to whoever is, you know, whatever the total circumstances are, they have to look at each case on its own merits and not have any preset rules. All right. So we're going to go into the articles. Anybody need five minutes for anything before we just jump right into them, keep going, try to get done? You okay. If you need time, feel free. And by the way, there's lots more food and stuff sitting here. If you want to get up and get something, I've some, seen people do that. I appreciate that. Do not feel you're glued to your seat just because I'm talking. Feel free to walk around. All right. Article one. This is the article that talks about your fiduciary duty for your client. So article one says you have a duty to protect and promote your client's interest. This is your primary obligation. You also, though, must treat all parties honestly. So the reason that's in there is you're supposed to protect and promote your client's interests above all. That's your primary functionality. But what if your client tells you to lie to somebody on their behalf? Well, you can't do that. Your duty to treat all parties honestly will trump your fiduciary duty to do what your client asks you to do. But if your client asks you to do something that's legal and ethical, you have a duty to follow what they want you to do. Um, so a key concept here is that a listing licensee must be particularly careful not to say anything about a property or the price of a property which harms the owner's interest. So that's a key concept. So what do we mean by that? So Article 1 says you have a duty to protect and promote your client's interest. Let me give you an example. You're on your first listing presentation. You're a new agent. You're going out to talk with a client. And you're looking at this Glita Tract House, and, and there's, you're saying, you know, I've done a market analysis, and it looks like everything in this neighborhood is selling right around 850. And you go out, and this house is nothing special. It's not bad, but it's nothing special. It's a typical 850 house. And the client says to you, well, I'll list with you today if you'll list it for 925. And you try to explain, well, that's not in your best interest because here's the list of properties. Here's the ones that are active for sale. Here's the ones that, that sold. And here's the ones that expired unsold. And at 925, this is the list you're going to end up on. And that's not where you want to be. You want to be in this list of solds. So it's in your best interest you listed at a lower price. And they go, yeah, well, I've already talked to other people that said they'll list it at 925. I like you. And if you'll list it at 925, I'll list it with you. But otherwise, I'm listed with somebody else. And your mind starts turning going, I can picture my sign in the yard with my name on it. I can put an ad in the paper. I can put this out on Facebook. I can start being successful by having a listing. How can I just turn this down? So you decide to take the listing. So now on your broker caravan, you're all excited. You've got some things. And the first agent that walks in said, how'd you come up with this price? What's your answer? 
What you want to say is, well, I thought it should have been less, but my client picked the price. That's what you want to say, right? If you say that, are you protecting and promoting your client's best interest? If you tell others that this house is overpriced, is that in your client's best interest? It's not. So if you would make that statement, and I guarantee you, you will hear it in your careers. Well, I didn't pick this price. The client did. I don't. I, I wanted them to go lower. Well, they just violated Article 1. So you can't say that. So now you have to say, well, let me point out, did you notice it's got all stainless steel appliances? Yeah, but that's not $75,000. Well, did you see that it's got a little bit bigger backyard than some of the houses in the neighborhood? And all you can do is just promote the, the property the absolute best you can. But what you can't say is it's not priced right because you're breaching your fiduciary duty to your client. So the bottom line on that one is you need to work with them to get them to price it right. It's in their best interest. It's not in their best interest to have you take it over overpriced listing. And that my philosophy has always been that you might have to spend days to try to help them, you know, hours maybe or days to try to get them to the point of rep recognizing value. Like go out and show them the competition so they can see for themselves that why would somebody pay 925 if they buy a house that's been fixed up like this for 875? You know, yours should be priced based on this at 850. You know, whatever it's going to be. But, you know, work with them to get it. You might have to spend hours or days to get them to price it right, but it will save you months of marketing an unsaleable property, which is not in your client best interest or your client's best interest. Um, but it's a tough, tough call. But just be aware, my recommendation to you regarding Article 1 is everything you say about a property you have listed, you do it as if the seller is sitting on your shoulder listening to every word you say, and at the end of the conversation they say, that was a good job, I like the way you represented me there. Because that's your fiduciary duty. You have to protect and promote the best interest of your client. Okay, Article 2. Disclose, disclose, disclose. So before you got into the business, people said, real estate's all about Location, location, location. Because you can't pick up a house and move it. You can always fix one up. It's more important to think about where the house is. But now that you're in the business, your duty is to make sure that both sides, not just your client, but both sides have full information to help them make good decisions. So what Article 2 continues is you need to avoid exaggeration, misrepresentation and concealment of pertinent facts about the property or the transaction. So that's a key concept. Avoid exaggeration, misrepresentation, and concealment of pertinent facts about the property or transaction. Now, what do those words mean? Exaggeration, misrepresentation, concealment. Those are the big fancy words for lying, right? So don't lie to people. Just tell it like it is. You have no obligation, however, to discover latent defects that are, or matters that are outside the scope of your license or matters that are confidential. Um, so on latent defects, like you don't have a duty to crawl through the attic to see if there's any cracks in the, in the roof rafters. And you don't have a duty to do that. But what you do have a duty to do is go through the house to see if there's anything that you can visually see that needs to be disclosed. Um, but you have to also remember that Article 2 doesn't just talk about the house. It talks about the property or the transaction. So say you're representing a buyer and they have a pre-qualification letter that you submit from ABC lender and you submit that along with your offer. So now you're 10 days into the transaction. They've got 17 days to get loan approval. And ABC just comes out and says, we're not going to make this loan. But in the meantime, your client, knowing that ABC was shaky, has put in another application with another lender they're waiting to hear back from. Do you need to tell the other side that ABC turned them down? Because they still might get their loan. They have 17 days to get a loan. And the answer is you absolutely need to tell them because that seller has a right to know. Think about it. Put, always put yourself in their shoes. If I was a seller and the buyer got turned down from the lender that they gave me a pre-qualification letter on, would I want to know that? 
because that seller might right now be starting to make an offer on a replacement property. They might be scheduling movers. They might be scheduling turning off their utilities because they think everything's great. But if they knew the deal was shaky, they'd maybe make different decisions. So the seller absolutely has the right to know. So if there's something that's transactional that's going on, put yourself on the other side. If Would I want to know that if I was in those other shoes? And if the answer is yes, then you have a duty to disclose it. I had agents come to me all the time saying, but I'm afraid to tell them that because they might cancel. Well, that's why you have to tell them because if it's something that's serious enough that they might cancel over, they, that's what you've got to tell them. You have to give them that information. Um, and you, you can say, and they've already got an application in with another lender. I just spoke to the other lender. They're feeling very confident about it. We've got the 17 days. We're going to make them in the 17 days. We feel good about that. We've got that extra week still. But that seller has the right to know. Through their agent, you make sure things get disclosed throughout the transactions. Okay, so a couple key concepts. One is the code prohibits exaggeration, misrepresentation, and concealment of pertinent facts. And the other is generally a licensee can rely upon statements made by a seller, such as in a TDS, unless they have reason to believe the information from the seller is not true. So a seller fills out a TDS and says everything in this property is fine. And then you walk through and find a major crack in the slab in the, in the garage. Well, you've got to disclose disclose that slack, that crack. I mean, you can't just take their word for it that everything is fine. But if you don't have, know anything to the contrary, you can rely on the fact of what the seller is saying. Because most sellers are truthful in their TDSs. But if they're not, then it's your duty to, to go in and, and talk about what's beyond that. Another key concept is, is that if there is a situation where somebody asks you what's going on with that property behind this one that's right now a vacant lot, and you don't know, you have to say, I don't know, but let me help you get the information. I'll take you to the city or county or whatever it is to find out. Because here's an example. You're at an open house and somebody comes in and says, what's going to happen with that lot area behind us? And you go, oh, this whole area is residential. And so they'll just someday there'll be more houses built back there. But you didn't really know, but you didn't want to say, I don't know, especially as a newer agent. It's like, oh, my God, I can't tell them I'm new. So I'm supposed to know this stuff, right? So I'll make something up good. Yeah, it's going to be residential. So they end up buying the house and then come to find out that they're going to put a concrete plant back there that's going to be grinding rock and making lots of noise. And they're going, well, what do you mean? That's supposed to be residential. When did they change the zoning? So they go to the city and find out it's always been zoned industrial. They've always had the right to do that. Do you think they might now have a lawsuit against that agent? Yeah. They could file a complaint against the agent because they weren't truthful. And the agent says, but I didn't really know. Is that a, is, is that a good enough reason to not give a right answer? If you don't know, you got to say you don't know. And then you help them find it out. So, and my recommendation on that one is don't go to the city and ask questions and then go back to the, the buyer and report in. Take the buyer to the city and go there together because I got to tell you, there have been so many times that the counter people in planning and development or, or land use or zoning or building have given wrong answers. And if you're the one that conveyed the wrong answer, they might hold you responsible for having not dug deeper to get the right answer. But if they're there and can ask any question they want to ask, now the city told them. But you're providing the service of taking them there to get the information. And you should be there, too, because you need to know also. But be very careful about being a conduit between a public agency because they're not always right when they give you an answer. <laughs> and you don't want to be liable for their wrong answer. Article three, cooperate with other brokers, except when cooperation is not in your client's best interest. The obligation to cooperate does not include an obligation to share commissions, fees, or otherwise compensate another broker. That obligation comes from the MLS. So by the way, 
What if you make an announcement? I'm looking, I've got a buyer looking for a property. And somebody says, yeah, I've got one that's coming to the market. It's not on the market yet. Great. Can I show it? Yep. Let's get you out there. So the property is not in the MLS. You go out and show the property, you write an offer. You, how much do you get paid? The answer is nothing unless you have a compensation agreement that states how much you're going to get paid. So if it's a property that's in the MLS, you're going to get paid what's in the MLS. If it's not in the MLS, what you need to do is lead with a compensation agreement before you present an offer. What's my compensation going to be? By the way, the statute of frauds in California has two exceptions to contracts having to be in writing. Rental agreements of less than a year can be verbal and be legally binding. And the second one is agreements between brokers, which translates down to salespeople in a brokerage on issues like commissions. So if you say, how much would I get paid if I sell this? And they say you'd get paid X percent. You can hopefully have a witness to that. You could, you could actually enforce that. But I would not rely on that. I would still lead with a compensation agreement and get it in writing of what the compensation is. So on Article 3, cooperate with other brokers except when it's not in the client's best interest. Here's a situation that actually has happened. A buyer goes by and see a sign in front of a house. Calls their agent and said, hey, that house on such and such street looks like something I'd like to see. Their own agent says, gee, I don't know about that one. Let me look it up. It's not in the MLS. And they say, well, I happen to see the sign. It's listed with so-and-so. Great. They call so-and-so about the listing at such-and-such. Such. I like my terminology there. Um, who says, yeah, sorry, we're not having any showings until it officially hits the market in a week. And he goes, but I've got a client that's really interested in that house. You know, what can I do to get him in? Yeah, sorry, I can't get you in. So this happens to be that client then calls the listing agent, says, I'm interested in this house. I'd really like to see it. And they go, okay, I can show it to you tomorrow. Now, does that sound right? And the answer is it's not right. Because it's if they can show it before the seven days, then they need to cooperate with other brokers on those showings. If they're saying no one's going to show it for seven days, okay. But to say... I can show it, but I'm not going to allow somebody else to show it. Well, the best buyer for that house who's going to pay him the most money might have been the agent's client that you didn't allow in while you try to double end it yourself. That's not in your client's best interest. It's in your client's best interest to cooperate with those other agents. So that would have been an Article 3 violation in that example I just gave. Article 4, advise in writing prior to an executed contract that you are a buyer or related to a buyer in the transaction or that the buyer is from your firm. And when selling, realtors shall disclose their ownership interest. So if you are buying property, and by the way, I highly recommend that you buy property, believe in your industry, that you're going to make money to pay your bills, etc., by selling real estate but you're going to build wealth by owning real estate. So you should have a plan where you are going to be investing in real estate. Think about that. I mean, that's the best retirement you can have. I mean, how many of you have a really good retirement plan in the form of something else from your real estate office? Yeah. So I think investing in real estate is a really good retirement plan, right? It's, it's been working for me, and I highly recommend it. So when you're writing an offer on a property, you have to disclose in writing that you are, in fact, a real estate licensee representing yourself in this transaction. Nothing wrong with it, but the law and the Code of Ethics both require disclosure. So when it says prior to an executed contract, that means put it in the contract prior to being signed by both sides. If you're selling your own house, you need to disclose that this is my house. So I had that happen to me one time. An offer came in that was for the price I wanted, the time frames I wanted, the escrow company I wanted, the termite company I wanted. Everything was like, like it's just the way I want it. But they didn't say buyers are aware of the seller 
is a real estate licensee. So I had to counter the offer. I couldn't just sign it because then I'd be disclosing it after an executed contract. So I had to put that in a counter offer. And the tough part of that was the agent bringing the offer in was the manager in the office that I was working for at the time for her husband, who was also a licensee. And we all knew each other and we all knew we were licensed. So I had to counter back saying seller is aware that the buyer is a licensee and related to the buyer's agent and the seller is a licensee to protect all of us because they hadn't disclosed it either. And it was like, it was my own darn manager who missed that. And it's like, come on folks. So anyway, if you are ever selling your own property or buying a property or for your close family members, your, your kids, your parents, whatever, you must make disclosure in writing in your offer that you are representing a family member or you are representing yourself, et cetera. It's easy to do, but it's, uh, don't miss it. Article five, realtors should not undertake to provide professional services concerning a property or its value where they have a present or contemplated interest unless such interest is specifically disclosed to all affected parties. So do you somehow have a relationship to this party? Is there something, are you part of an LLC that owns it or something else where it's not a direct ownership thing, but if you have some kind of relationship, it needs to be disclosed also. Article six, do not accept any commission, rebate, or profit on expenditure made for or by your client without your client's knowledge or consent. Disclose any financial benefits received when recommending real estate products or services. So it doesn't say you can't get some form of compensation from some other party. It just says it has to be disclosed. So what if you're selling real estate and you also own a termite company? And now you want to do the termite inspection for your client. Can you do that? And the answer is yes, as long as it's with the client's knowledge and consent and it's disclosed. So I had a situation happen to me that I had to be careful on. I had been recommending getting carpets cleaned when people were listing their homes with me. It was a pretty typical thing. Like, Paint your front door because the front door is the first thing they ever see. And if it's got chips on it, they're going to think, what's, how's the rest of the house look? And fix any plumbing leaks and things like that. But I also recommend cleaning carpets because often, the, you know, carpets hadn't been cleaned in a couple of years and just spiffs them up, makes them look better for the showings. And I found a carpet cleaner that was new in the business and was doing the job for a whole lot less than anybody else because he's trying to build his reputation. And he was doing a really good job. So I was recommending to people and I had, one time he contacted me and said, you know, you've given me a lot of business. He says, I'm pretty sure you've referred five pe people to me already. He says, what I want to do is I'll give you 10% off your carpet cleaning for everybody you recommend. He says, for right now, since you've done five, I'll give you half off your carpet cleaning. And I thought, yeah, that's nice, but I don't want my clients thinking I'm only recommending you because I'm getting a kickback. And if I get a kickback, I have to, in writing, disclose to them that I'm getting compensated every time you clean their carpet. I don't want to go there. I said, let's do this instead. I said, how about I recommend to people that they use you as a carpet cleaner? And then once you've given them a bid, I'm going to tell them, now tell them you're Bob Hart's client and give them 10% off their carpet cleaning. He goes, sure, no problem for me. I said, great. So now I'm a hero to all these people because they all get the Bob Hart discount. That was much more valuable to me than 10% off my carpet cleaning. And I know no, now I don't have to disclose anything because I'm saving them money rather than getting some kind of rebate myself. So just think about it. If you're faced with a situation like that, how can you turn it into a positive instead of just saying, sorry, I can't accept that. Is there a way you can turn it to your client's best interest like I did? So just, just think about that, but don't accept money. Now, you will have times in a transaction that you're going to get a disclosure form from some big real estate company saying, we want you to know that we have a partial interest in this title company, a partial interest in this lending company, whatever, just in case either client uses one of those subsidiary industries, they're disclosing that they might be receiving a financial benefit. 
from something else in the transaction. So some of these big corporate companies, they own enough stuff, they have a standard disclosure on every transaction. But that's why, because they need to disclose it here. Article 7, do not accept compensation from more than one party, even if permitted by law without disclosure to all parties. Watch for a C, no, I was going to say CRS class, but that's, yeah, CRS class, certif no, it's a certified residential specialist. That's not the one I'm looking for. ABR, accredited buyer representative. Watch for an ABR class coming up at some point in the future because it teaches you how to work with buyers, including working with buyers under contract. Because how many people in this industry have worked with a buyer, shown them property, said, you know, after <clears throat> three weeks of showing them property almost every day, saying, oh, I found this property. That's great. Do you want to buy this one? Yeah, we do. Well, great. Let's go back to the office and write up. So oh, I can't do that. My sister is an agent in L.A. She's told me I should work with a local agent until I found a property, and then she'd write it up for me. And you go, wait a minute. Well, what about all the time I spent with you? Yeah, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Well, when do you want to find that out? You know, do you want to work with the buyer? You want to ask those questions up front. Well, what's even better is work under contract with the buyer, where the buyer agrees to pay you for helping them find a house, which is offset by what the seller pays. And sometimes you find one that has a really low commission rate, and then that means that the buyer has to pay the difference, but it also means that the other agents in town probably aren't showing that property, and your buyer can get a better deal because of that. So it's okay to work under buyer brokerage and have the buyer have to pay some commission and the seller pay some commission. That's totally okay. What this says is you can't do it without disclosure. So you just have to say, I'm receiving this amount of compensation from the seller, this amount from the buyer. And have both buyer and seller sign it, everything's fine. But you can't do it without disclosing it. Do not commingle client money with your own or your firm's money. Number one violation for which real estate brokers have discipline against their license is commingled funds. Property management typically, sometimes it's escrow accounts or something. And sometimes it's a matter of the way they commingled funds was they had money from a client paid into their trust account and they were supposed to pay themselves out of the trust account and didn't do it in a timely enough manner and left too much money in the trust account. That's a violation because now they're commingling what money should have been their own with their clients. But let me tell you where you as an individual might face an issue. Say you've got a client that calls and says, you know, I know you've been farming this neighborhood for a long time because you send me stuff, even though I'm an absentee owner living in Arizona. I've just decided my tenant's moving out of the house and I want to sell it. Can you go by and take a look at the house? The tenant left a key under the mat. Take a look at it and give me recommendations of what I should do to fix it up and what I can sell it for. So you go through and, and you say, wow, the tenant's really left this house in pretty darn nice shape. You know, you're pretty fortunate as a landlord. Um, and let me give you an idea of what the uh, the price should should be on it. And but there are a couple things. Front door should be painted, should have some carpet cleaned, and you need to fix a drippy faucet in the kitchen. And as a good agent, you went out and got estimates for all those things. I can get somebody to paint that front door for you for 75 bucks. I can get the carpets cleaned for 100 bucks, and I can get the faucet replaced in the kitchen for 125. So it's for 300 bucks, we can. Get everything done. I know I'm low on my prices, but that's okay. It's, it's easier for the math. So client says, great. You know, thank you for that. Yeah, let's list the house. And, and so you say, okay, just send me a check for them for 300 bucks and I'll take care of it. So he sends you a check for 300 bucks. You put it in your account and you write a check to the painter. You write a check to the carpet cleaner. You write a check to the plumber. Adds up to 300 bucks. You got all the receipts. You send the receipts off to the seller. And you just violated Article 8, and you're going to be brought up on charges for violating the Code of Ethics, and you just violated state law and you lost your real estate license because you co-mingled clients' money with your own. You took their 300 bucks and stuck it in your own checking account. So how do you solve that problem? You say to them, send me three checks, one made out to the plumber, one made out to the painter, one made out to the carpet cleaner, and I will deli deliver them once the job is satisfactorily completed. Now you don't have a problem, but don't ever take their money and put it in your account. That's a violation of 
the code and the law. So what if you would have paid those things out first and he reimbursed you 300 bucks? That would have been okay because now he's just paying you back for money you already spent. It's no longer his money when you put it in your account. But if you put it in account first, you're commingling clients' monies with your own. Article 9, agreements shall be in writing whenever possible in clear and understandable language, expressing the terms, conditions, obligations, and commitments of the parties, and a copy of each agreement shall be furnished to each party upon the signing or initialing. So now with zip form, you automatically send via email a copy to your clients when they sign, so that's all taken care of for you. But do you understand that all offers and things need to be in writing? So if you're making an offer, you're clearly making an offer in writing. There should be no verbal offers. You don't call another agent and say, my client would want to make an offer on this property. He wants to offer such and such. Is that okay? No, write it up. You shouldn't, there shouldn't be a verbal offer because it can't be legally binding if it, even if it comes to agreement. It has to be in writing to be legally binding, and it's your duty to get it in writing. So it's pretty clear that you're not going to have a listing contract without it being in writing. You're not going to have a purchase contract without it being in writing. But what about all the other things, amendments and price reductions and, and things like that? They all have to be in writing. So a client says, you know, we got, we've had this house listed for two weeks. Let's reduce the price. Can you just go into the MLS and reduce it based on a verbal? And the answer is no. You have to have a change in um, terms or whatever it is, an amendment. Forms are available to you. I can't remember the name exactly, but it's got to be in writing. Um, here's an example of something that, that could happen, and that is you've got a situation where you are getting a physical inspection done, and the inspector you like using has been busy. You only had 10 days to get this contingency removed in your contract. And so you couldn't get the inspector there until the 10th day, but you can get him there on the 10th day. So it's like, okay, we can meet the terms. So on that 10th day, say that was today, and you, the inspector calls and says, man, I've got the stomach flu. Went through everybody in my house. I know it's a 24-hour bug. I'll be back at it tomorrow, and I'll rearrange my schedule to get yours done tomorrow, but I just can't make it today. So you call the listing agent and say, you know, I, I – the inspector's sick, can't make it, can we have until tomorrow? The list agent says, yeah, that, that's reasonable. I don't see a problem with that. So now the inspector does the inspection tomorrow. You come up with a list of things you want repaired. You send in a list to the seller to say we want these things fixed, and the seller says go pound sand. You had a 10-day contingency. What do you mean give me a list on day 11? You have no right to make these requests. I'm not doing a darn thing for you because – Officially, you've removed that contingency as of the 10th day. And you're going, but, 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 but we called, and your agent said it was okay. And he said, yeah, my agent, your, that agent never checked with me. I never signed an extension of time. Who's wrong there? And the answer is both agents, because it should never have been negotiated verbally. It needs to be in writing. You're changing the terms of the contract. It's got to be in writing. So an Article 9 violation just occurred. So if that buyer says, but now I can't get things fixed that the seller should have been responsible for fixing, I'm going to file a complaint against my agent. Would the agent win that one? The answer is no, because the agent had a duty to put that request in writing and get it signed as a contractual change. All right, so as key concepts under Article 9, there's actually two, but both of them go with the fact that agreements to be in writing extends to all listings, sales, amendments, etc. Oh, here's an interesting one. Sexual orientation and gender identity are protected classes where? Is it in state and federal law, but not in the Code of Ethics? California state law and the code, but not in federal law. They're not protected classes at all. Or they're protected in all three. What do you think is the right answer there? You're saying D, they're protected in all three. And the answer is they are state law and the code, but not in federal law. 
as of yet? Answer B. So sexual orientation and gender identity are both protected classes per the Code of Ethics, but not in federal law. And they are in our state statutes. So what's interesting is you could have somebody in one of probably 40 states, there's maybe 10 that haven't protected already, but one of 40 states where the seller or landlord ha can legally discriminate against somebody because of their sexual orientation. I won't rent to you because of your gender identity or sexual identification, uh, sexual orientation. So, but the realtor on their behalf cannot discriminate because it, they're covered under the code. Anyway, there's, there's statutes happening right now at the federal level to try to get that changed at the federal level, but it hasn't happened yet. So Article 10 says, do not discriminate against any person or persons on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. So that's in the Code of Ethics. Our Code of Ethics has hit 50 years. And what's very interesting is 50 years ago, <laughs> The National Association of Realtors lobbied against the uh, fair housing laws. The Code of Ethics in 1940 had a section in it that said, a realtor shall be found in violation of the code if they introduce into the neighborhood someone of a different ethnic background that could upset the character of the neighborhood. Not only was discrimination not protected, it was required. We've come a long way. We're not there yet, but things have gotten better. So as far as Article 10 is concerned, here's the way I look at it. If someone wants to buy a house and they have the financial ability, they're my new best friend. And I don't care where they came from, what they look like, what their preferences are for partners. It just doesn't matter. If they want to buy a house and they've got the financial ability, I like them. Now, it's more than that because you also have to not steer them into something like, oh, well, people like you should live in this kind of neighborhood or not in this kind of neighborhood. If you're showing a white person property and not showing them property in a minority neighborhood, that's steering. You're trying to guide them to where they should be. You need to have discussions with them. Let's talk about the neighborhood you want to live in, the type of home you want to live in, et cetera. And you should not put you, any of your biases on that. Um, now, what if they don't have the financial ability? They don't have enough money for a down payment. They don't have enough income to make a loan payment. Should you keep showing them property? And the answer is no, that's a business decision. There's nothing in here that says don't discriminate against people without money because you have to have the financial ability to buy a home. So that just makes sense. Now, having said that, you're going to come across some people that maybe somebody else said they don't have enough financial ability, but you know of a down payment assistance program that not everybody knows about, or you can help them get into the right lender or whatever, and you can help them purchase a home where others told them they weren't able to. Oh, my God, that's a wonderful thing to be able to do for people. And some of the best days in real estate were ones where I'm handing somebody the keys who've been told by five or six other people they'll never be homeowners. I mean, that's just the coolest thing ever. But if they clearly don't have the financial ability, cut them loose. Um, my wife looked, was showing property to somebody one time, and she was kind of questioning, like, and where's your money coming from? And she pulled out a letter that she had from Publishers Clearinghouse saying that in small print, if your name is selected, they're going to say, we will come to your house and award you $1 million. And she had her letter and she wanted to go out and buy a house because she thought it was real. So just be careful. Make sure you ask the question, you know, where is this money right now before you spend too much time with them? Article 11, the services which realtors provide to their clients and customers shall conform to the standards of practice and competence for which they're reasonably expected in the specific real estate disciplines in which they engage. Realtors shall not undertake to provide specialized services concerning a type of property or service that's outside the field of competence unless they engage the assistance of one who is 
competent on such types of property or service or unless the facts are fully disclosed to the client. <coughs> Somebody comes to you and says, I know you have to have a real estate license to help sell a business and I want to sell a liquor store. Can you help me? And you go, oh yeah, I'm the business opportunity specialist in my office and you've never done anything with business. Well, do you know how to properly evaluate the inventory and do you sell it at the cost it was paid for it or what the replacement cost is? Is it at retail? Is it a wholesale? I mean, how do you value this? And how much is the lease worth if the lease is about to run out versus one that's got a long term to go on it? You know, those kinds of things. It's a whole different world, but your license allows you to do it. So the first question you want to ask is, does my broker have experience here? Can I have my broker or my manager help me with the transaction? If the answer is yes, then, then you're now you're okay. Or is there another agent I could work with that could help me with that? But to just take it on, not knowing what you're doing, Article 11 says you got to know what you're doing. So you might say, but I've never sold a house before, and here I sit. Yeah, but has your broker or manager ever sold a house before? Can they help you? Then you're okay. The one I'm starting to question is these people that come from out of the area. We have... So many people that are joining our MLS from San Diego and Los Angeles and whatever else because they want to come to Santa Barbara and sell a house. But do they have any idea what the values are and what is a fair price for this house? Are they out there caravanning to know the inventory so they can advise their clients on what they should offer? That type of thing. It's like, no, they're not. They're only looking out, can I make a buck by going to Santa Barbara and selling one of these higher priced properties? That's not in the client's best interest. I got a call one day from an agent from Agora Hills saying, is there anything special about selling a house in Santa Barbara? And I said, well, yes. She said, well, like what? And I said, well, that's not for me to say. But yes, there are things. And I said, why are you asking? She said, well, I've got a listing in Santa Barbara that I, I took from my office in Agora Hills. And I just assumed the buyer would be represented by a Santa Barbara agent, and so I could make sure that every, all the Santa Barbara issues got taken care of. And lo and behold, an offer came in from an agent in San Diego. And so now I don't know if there's anything special I need to do. And I go, wow, your clients aren't getting good service, are they? And she said, well, what do you think I should do? I said, I think you should contact a local broker and work with them to make sure that your client is properly protected. And she says, well, can't you just tell me what's different in Santa Barbara? I thought, no way, I can't go there. Because I might tell you two or three things, but what if there's four or five? You know, it's like, I, I'm not in my position, I'm not there to help somebody learn about zoning information reports and sewer lateral inspections. And that's, that's not my job. Um, I'll help our members know about that so they, you know, can do a better job. Um, but, it's not my job to help someone from out of town because Article 11 says you really shouldn't be doing that. If you don't have the competency, then don't represent these people. So there's a big push for having a statewide MLS, and it may happen someday. But that doesn't mean it makes sense for you to go to Reading and sell a house. Because how do you know what the comps are, what things have been selling for, and, and et cetera? I mean, it's just you, you just don't know. You know, what's happening in these neighborhoods? What's happening in the field behind this one? Is it going to be an industrial plant someday? And everybody up there knows that, but you didn't. You know, those kinds of things. So just, just be aware that you need to have competency in what you're doing. And that carries out to the broker level. Article 12, a code of, the key concept here is that advertising is regulated by the Code of Ethics. So Article 12 requires truth and and honesty in all real estate communications. So if you're doing print ads, you're doing something on Facebook, you're doing something somewhere else, you can't be lying. You gotta be putting accurate information out. A property sells, you must remove an ad. I mean, I saw one, one of the worst case scenarios I saw was one where somebody's website had properties on it that she had listed two to three years ago and she still had them up there because she didn't wanna show that she didn't have any listings. And so she kept her listings up on her website. Well, that's advertising that they're for sale. And they're not for sale. They closed two years ago and they're still on her website as being an active listing. If she wants to say, I sold this two years ago, well, that's okay. But to say it's an active listing, 
clearly a violation. We've had violations of this where people have put an ad in for sale by owner section on Craigslist about a property. The agent didn't have any ownership rights in it, but just thought, well, if I put in this for sale by owner, I'll get people to call me who wouldn't have called me if I told them I was an agent. Okay, that's good. Let's lie to people so that they'll call you. Uh, no, that's a violation of Article 12. You must be truthful and honest in all communications. So does that mean you have a small old house? You have to call it small and old? No, you can still call it cute and, cute and charming because we all know that cute and charming means small and old, right? But, you know, so... You've got some latitude on some things like that, but you can't say a house is for sale if it's not. You can't say you have a listing if you don't have a signed listing agreement. We've seen people advertise things before. A seller says, I'm thinking of selling, and the agent starts advertising it. No, you can't advertise if you don't have a signed listing contract. You just can't do that because you're implying you do. So it's got to be truthful. So Article 12 says be honest and truthful in real estate communications, present a true picture in your advertising, marketing, and other representations, ensure your status as a real estate professional is readily apparent in advertising, like don't say you're a for sale by owner, uh, and other representations. Uh, all right. Article 13, do not engage in activities that constitute the unauthorized practice of law and shall recommend legal counsel be obtained when the interest of a party to a transaction requires it. Have you noticed that in your purchase contracts, you have a lot of places where you can fill in the blanks and very few places where you can write text? The reason for that is these contracts were created by attorneys. If you created the contract, that would be considered giving legal advice to your client. But if you use a contract that is basically filled out and you're just filling in dates and times and, and locations and things like that, then you're not giving any legal advice. But if you just started with a blank sheet of paper and said, let me draw, draft a contract for you, it would be a problem. It's so specifically for your protection, that's why we have bazillion pages in our contracts is because they want to put every possibility in there for you so you don't get in trouble for providing legal advice. But what are other areas where maybe you could be providing legal advice? And every buyer is asked when they buy a home, how do you want to take title? Do they want it to be in a trust? Do they want it tenants in common? Do they want it community property? Do they want joint tenancy? They want community property, the right of survivorship. You know, what form of title do they want to take? The average first time buyer is baffled and they have no idea. Well, you are their trusted advisor. So they come to you and say, ah, I got this thing about how to take title. I don't know how to take title. What do you think I should do? And you go, well, I took title as joint tenants. I think you, you joint tenancy would probably make sense for you. The answer is no, because there may be some ramifications of that that's going to adversely affect them five or six years from now. So the answer that you have to give on that one is the manner in which you take title has significant tax and legal consequences. Therefore, I recommend you speak with an attorney and or an accountant as to how to take title. Now, does it sound like I've said that before? It's because it's rote. It's like I've said that for 30 years. The manner in which you take title has significant tax and legal consequences. Therefore, I recommend you speak with an attorney and or an accountant as to how to take title. Because if I give them a recommendation, I'm giving them legal advice and I'm outside the scope and I'm violating Article 13. So there's certain times like you want to help people all the time. There's certain things you just can't go there. So. The title companies have a sheet that they prepare that explains the differences between the types of title. Give that to your clients so they can read it over and they know what questions to ask of someone else. Um, but be careful, don't give them legal advice. Um, one other thing when I said about there's certain things, it reminds me of one from Article 1 I didn't cover. And I want to mention it. And that is, say you're out on a house and 
you're previewing for your client in the seller's home when you're previewing and the seller says to you, well, what do you think of the price? What would your answer be? Oh, I think it's a good price. Or thinking I'm representing the buyer here, I think it's a little high. So when we bring in an offer a little lower, you're going to be able to represent your buyer better. What's the right answer? And the right answer is, I'm sorry, I can't have that discussion with you. I can't go there because you have an agency relationship with your listing agent and it'd be inappropriate for me to answer that question. And that's okay. And I would maybe even follow up with saying, if you'd like to have your listing agent call me, I'd be glad to discuss it with them because I can do that. But it's unfortunately, it's inappropriate that I have that discussion with you. Because if you say, I think it's priced well, maybe that listing agent's been working to try to get a price reduction. And now they're saying, well, I talked to another agent. He said it's okay. And you just shot that listing agent in the foot. You interfered with their agency. Or what if they say, um, oh, I, I, I think it's a little, little high in that listing agent saying to the seller, don't do a price reduction. You're okay where you are. You just can't go there. You can't interfere with their agency relationship. So anyway, that one just came to mind while we're here. So I thought let me just cover it. Article 14, if charged with an unethical practice yourself, or if you're asked to present evidence or to cooperate in any other way with a professional standards proceeding or investigation, realtors shall place pertinent facts before the proper tribunals. So if you're called in to be a witness and you're saying, but I don't want to be a witness, I don't want to have to go in and, and talk about what somebody else did that wasn't right. I don't want to get involved. Well, yours might be the next case if you don't want to get involved because the code says you've got to. If, if you're asked to provide information to be a witness, whatever, you got to do it. It's a requirement so that we can make sure that everything works. Article 15, do not knowingly or recklessly make false or misleading statements about other real estate professionals, their business or their business practice. Somebody says, well, what do you think of John Smith? My answer would be, oh, is he out of jail? Um, that actually would not be a good answer. Um, but uh, just don't go there. It's just, my answer always was, let me tell you about me. And if you want to talk to John Smith, talk to John Smith. But I'm, I'm not here to talk about what other people do. And whether I like them or don't like them doesn't really matter. Um, so be careful. But you'll see people sometimes say things about, oh, yeah, I would never list with that guy because of blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, nah, don't go there. Um, the main thing is do not knowingly or recklessly make false or misleading statements. If it's facts that you're talking about, because it might be you're looking out for some client because you know that this person was just arrested for fraud, but the real estate commissioner hasn't pulled their license yet. It's under investigation. If that's a factual statement, then it might be in that client's best interest you let them know that. I mean, I've never had that actually come up, but just, just be careful. And the best way is just not talk about other, other agents. Okay, so when can you talk to the client of another? Can you never talk to a client of another? If they contact you first and ask you about your services, is it okay to talk with somebody that's under an agency relationship? If it's within three days of their listing expiring, is it okay? Or only if they're asking for a price opinion, is it okay? Which, which one of those three do you think? Four do you think it is? And the answer is B. There are times. So let's talk about Article 16. Do not engage in any practice or any action inconsistent with the agency or exclusive relationship that other realtors have with their clients. So you need to respect relationships. However, there are two exceptions to the fact that you shouldn't ever be contacting somebody else's client. And that's outside the scope of I mean, Obviously, it's okay to call somebody and say, can I show your house? You know, those kinds of things. I mean, that has to happen just for routine business. But there's two times that you can contact them about business that's okay. And the first is, if you have an offer on somebody's property and you cannot reach the listing agent, you have the right to go to the seller and present. Now, let me more clearly define that. The broker is the agent of the seller, right? Not the salesperson, but the broker ultimately. So if you're trying to reach a salesperson and can't reach them, 
that doesn't give you the right to go to the seller directly. You'd have to now kick it up and contact the brokerage and see if there's anybody in that company that can meet with you to present the offer, or to, you know, make contact with the seller, whatever. The other thing is, it's not a matter of, well, I've been trying for the last 20 minutes and I can't reach them, so I'm going to go take this offer directly to the seller. No, we're talking maybe after days of diligent effort that we find out that the listing agent, who is a one-person broker office, went out skiing and unfortunately fell on his cell phone and broke it and has no communication. You know, something like that. Okay, under those circumstances, it's in both clients' best interest that offer gets presented. You have the right to go present that offer. For all of you, my recommendation is if you ever get into a situation like that, kick that up to your broker. Don't make that call by yourself because it's the broker who would need to ultimately go around the, the agency relationship. The second one is that you have the right to talk to somebody if they come to you. So you have somebody come to you and say, you know, I've, I've been seeing your ads in the paper. I've been watching your open houses. I'm really impressed with what you're doing. My house is currently listed, and it's going to expire in, in two weeks. Can I talk to you about what you could do for me once my house expires? And the answer is, yes, you can talk to them about your services. What you can't do is interfere with that existing relationship for the next two weeks. So you, <clears throat> so you can't say your agent should have blah, 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 blah. No, you're interfering with their agency relationship. But if you want to lay out, here's my plan. Here's what I would do. Here's how I would advertise your property. Here's what I, my marketing plan, whatever. You can do that. For your protection, I recommend you get what's called a letter of non-solicitation. There's no form for this in zip form. But just have them write on a piece of paper, I contacted you about your services. You didn't solicit me. Just so that you have a protection in case somebody ever files a complaint for you for violating Article 16, you say, no, I didn't. And here's a written proof from the client themselves saying they asked me about my services. So you don't have to say to them, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. You actually can under those circumstances. And that's in the, the standards of practice, whatever, that that's an okay thing. You can even go to the point of signing a listing contract to begin the day after the listing expires, something like that. But you can't interfere with what's happening under the current one. So as a key concept, it talks about under no circumstances may a realtor talk to negotiator discuss real estate matters with clients of another realtor. That would not be a true statement. That would be false because they can, in fact, talk to someone under those circumstances. So examples of issues covered by Article 16 are innovative, aggressive business practice, advertising, soliciting, which may be received by the client. So one of the things they talk about in there is, say you're sending out flyers to 300 people in a neighborhood, and it happens to be that two of them have listed houses, and you inadvertently sent a flyer saying, let me tell you about how I can help you get your home sold to people that are already listed. Did you violate Article 16? And the answer is no. If it's a mass mailing that was not intended specifically to target them, then it's not a problem. The recommendation is if you know they're listed, pull theirs out and not don't mail it to them. But if you send out flyers about a neighborhood market report or whatever, and it happens to go to people that are currently listed, that's not a violation that's spelled out here. All right, Article 17 talks about arbitration. So we basically covered that um, under the arbitration section. Clients can invoke mandatory arbitration with their realtor principals. Realtors are obligated to cause their firms to arbitrate, um, and, and realtors must arbitrate contractual and specific non-contractual disputes as defined there. Okay, so what is the code of ethics? It protects the buying and selling public, promotes a competitive real estate marketplace, enhances the integrity of the industry. It's our promise of performance, our promise of professionalism. So I'm hoping that from today you're going to walk out of here with a better understanding of what the code says and what you need to do, but also with the understanding of this is an ethical business. You need to behave ethically. People appreciate that. They expect that of you. 
Um, we have excellent realtors in Santa Barbara that will cooperate. I'm always impressed with people that will help others. Um, if you think about it, who's your competition? It's every single other realtor in town, in your office or any other office. And yet, if you're in your office and you need help with something, will people give you a hand? Yeah, but you're their competition. Will people from other companies give you a hand? Yes. This training session we just had, Realtors at Rock, these guys are in there just laying out exactly what they do in their business to be successful. And yet, that's helping their competitors. I mean, that's cool. That happens in Santa Barbara, so let's keep it happening in Santa Barbara by you guys treating the next group well as you get experience and, and give them a leg up and help the whole industry get better rather than just working about what's in it for you. So anyway, I'm, I am very proud to have been a realtor for 30 years. I still pay my dues to be a realtor, even though I've gotten a paid job now where I'm not selling real estate. Um, and I'm happy to do that. And think about the fact that you can build wealth by owning real estate. Do what you can to, to own property. Take advantage of 1031 exchanges where you tr can trade up and get into, get into something more. It's a great industry. And as an independent contractor, it's up to you to decide how you're going to work. So work smart. Because I've had agents that work for me that they put in 12, 14, 16 hours a day, but they never met people. It's a people business. Like I mentioned earlier, there's no such thing as a successful secret agent. The best thing I, advice I can give you is every day go out and meet new people. Including like you got to go to a grocery store. You just walk up to somebody, hi, I, I sell real estate. How can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? I love to help people. Just imagine if you did that all the time, you get a few laughs and chuckles. But do you think you'd ever find somebody that needed to buy or sell some real estate and make a few more transactions per year just because you're out there talking to people? So think about it. Be successful. If there's anything that we can do for you from the Association of Realtors, our main focus is we want you to be successful. So we talk about the rules, the regulations, and all that. But the bottom line is what can we do to help you be more successful? If there's something you need, let us know. If there's something we can be doing better, let us know because we want to help you guys be successful. So welcome to the world of real estate. You are now officially realtors. I don't know if you didn't realize this, but you were not realtors until you completed orientation.